Thank you so much. Uh, I have the unenviable task of finding something to talk to you about that others haven't. I was going to launch a proper attack on international human rights, but someone else already did that, so I'm going to have to, uh, to rewrite my speech a bit. Um, thank you so much, Nick, for having me. I'm so thrilled to be able to, uh, to come home and speak on these issues. Um, uh, I, I recommend, if anyone wants to understand the nature and scope of privacy violations in Australia, at the moment to travel to three airports over three days and try and access Wi-Fi in each of those airports. I could not believe the details that I had to hand over, um, including my date of birth, my postcode, my name and my email address um, at Melbourne Airport, actually. Um, many of you may have heard about the famous um, Harvard study that showed that with those three pieces of information, your date of birth, your postcode and your name, they can uniquely identify 87%, sorry, not your name, uh, your, your postcode, your date of birth and, and one other thing. Um, they can uniquely identify 87% of the population and in fact, a study was done on anonymised um, medical records that were anonymised as part of this big open data thing um, announced by the Governor of Massachusetts, a group of MIT researchers went through the anonymised records on the basis of certain pieces of information were able to uniquely identify the Governor of Massachusetts and took his whole medical file to his house and put it on the front doorstep. Um, so I hate to think what uh, Melbourne Airport's now doing with my information. Um, I was going to start my speech talking about the, uh, the Stasi, the East German State Security Service, um, but when I was on the drum the other night, I got, <laughs> I got interrogated about my use of that analogy. And I think fairly enough in the sense that um, it is a bit of a tired analogy, I think, when you go to enough privacy tech conferences, there's always at least one Stasi reference. I'm going to talk about them anyway, but I do think that it is a bit um, illustrative of the problem with surveillance which is that um, so few of the um, pernicious activities of surveillance services are visible to us uh, while those intelligence services remain in power. It's only after they lose power often that we find out exactly what was going on. Um, so Stasi has become the go-to example. Um, but of course we could replace our Stasi analogies with a number of others. We have, for example, the Romanian uh, Securitate, I think it's pronounced, um, which had half a million informants and 11,000 employees in a country the same population as Australia um, and was widely known to be responsible for torture, assassinations, etc. Um, currently in Ethiopia, the Ethiopian National Intelligence and Security Services is extremely heavily handed, um, doing things like including recently arresting the Zone 9 bloggers. I'm not sure if many of you have heard about them. They're a blogging contingent from Ethiopia who were arrested on terrorism charges related to what they wrote in their blog, um, but also were additionally charged with conspiracy for the very fact that they used encryption, which was seen to be um, evidence of their um, criminal activities itself. Um, and some of you may have seen the Egyptian intelligence agency in June set, sent out a call for tenders for open source intelligence technology, um, which got leaked, and the call for tender shows that they want open source intelligence to be able to, and I quote, track destructive ideas published on such networks, including blasphemy and skepticism in religions, uh, spreading of rumors and intentional twisting of facts, using inappropriate words, calling for the departure of societal pillars, pornography, looseness, and a lack of morality, educating methods of making explosives, uh, fishing for honest mistakes, hunting flesh, taking statements out of context, and spreading hoaxes and claims of miracles. Um, so uh, don't plan on doing any of those things in Egypt anytime soon. Um, but to return briefly to the Stasi, um, until the fall of the Berlin Wall, uh, the Stasi kept files on about 5.6 million people in East Germany, which was a third of the country's population. One of those people was an activist and dissident called Ulrika Popper, um, and she was spied on for 15 years, and she was a student activist and, and later um, a women's rights activist. And when the wall fell, like many others, she got access to her Stasi file, um, which the German government has commendably made a real effort to, um, to, to expose to transparency. And she, in 1992, received 40 binders full of information um, that had covered 15 years, and somewhere in the vicinity of 20,000 pages. Many of you will have heard of the, the Facebook versus Europe case, sorry, Europe versus Facebook case, which is being led by a young Austrian guy called Max Schrems, 
um, on the basis of a user access request that he made to Google in 2010. And he received 1,200 pages pertaining to his previous three years' use of Facebook, including deleted posts and status updates that he never actually um, sent. Um, so one need only, need only consider the other, many other telecommunications and communication services that Max uses to have a, uh, an initial understanding of how many pages of data exist out there about him. It makes the Stasi files pale in comparison. Life under the Stasi was invariably, I'm sorry, undeniably one where privacy was in serious jeopardy. Which is not to say it wasn't valued by the citizens of East Germany. People went to great lengths and risked much to seek to subvert and ultimately suppress the surveillance activities of the state. So does it mean if you live in a society in which privacy is not valued by your government that privacy is not important to you? Um, are we therefore in this what we call, quaintly call the digital era still? How do, we, how do we understand privacy? Are we post-privacy as the uh, poster provocatively suggests? Um, privacy is undeniably under threat by the surveillance activities um, of the powerful. Those, that powerful not, includes not only governments but also private entities. Whereas under the uh, East German um, situation, the government was internationally condemned and recognised as a totalitarian authoritarian state. However, today's su surveillance is actively and openly promoted by democratic states. And today, individuals offer up inestimable amounts of personal information about themselves into the public domain or into what they think are private places, but about which they, we are told we should know better that they're actually public places. So does this mean we don't care about privacy? Is privacy no longer important to us, to our governments, to the private sector? Are we post-privacy? As a privacy advocate, someone who spends their days grappling with a belief that if you boil it down to its most fundamental is privacy good, surveillance bad, but which if you spend more than about three minutes thinking about it is far more complex and nuanced than that. I'm here to tell you that categorically we are not post-privacy. And we were not post-privacy when ID cards were invented, CCTV cameras, biometrics, databases, computers. Uh, we're not post-privacy just because we use digital tools that help us connect, learn and interact with greater speed and efficiency than we could have ever imagined. We don't forfeit our right to our interest in or our need for privacy just because we use the internet. We're not post-privacy and we never will be because privacy is a fundamental human right. We're not going to just get over it because it's under threat or because it's difficult. Uh, it's part of what makes us human. Saying we're post-privacy because we face serious threats to the right is like saying we're post-non-discrimination because women still face structural discrimination in the workplace or we're post-freedom of expression because states still censor books and movies. Privacy remains a fundamental human right and a societal good, which is not to underestimate the gravity of the threats that it faces. They are many and they are daunting, uh, as I will elaborate shortly. It is merely to say that they are not existential threats, and in some form or another they have actually always existed. The same thing about privacy that makes privacy such an important right to individuals is also what it makes it such a threat to the state. It's about power the power of individuals to make decisions, to formulate thoughts, to live and communicate and innovate on their terms without fear of interference. It's about individual autonomy in the face of state power and increasingly corporate power. And it's about what we call the social contract, the delicate balance of power between the state and the citizen. Because privacy is about power, it's always going to be under threat. It's in a permanent state of defence. But we have not lost the war, and far from it, I would say, in fact, we're in the midst of a really monumental fortification of privacy, a strengthening of defences, an enlargement of numbers. For the first time, I think privacy is getting the explicit recognition that it deserves, and it's being talked about and developed and strengthened and articulated with far greater reach and regularity than ever before. So in that sense, we see not the end of privacy, but its ascent, its amplification. Um, it was interesting that Tim Wilson chose to speak about the formulation of the Universal Declaration of Human Rights because I also did my homework and spent some time reading the transcripts of that, um, those meetings, which took two years between 1946 and 1948. And it's a really um, 
uh, interesting thing to do because you have a, a sense of what governments were really considering when they were writing the Universal Declaration of Human Rights. They'd just experienced the Holocaust. Europe was in tatters. And they wanted to draw a line in the sand. They wanted to say, here are the fundamental principles that define what it is to be human against which all future governments will be measured and held to account. And privacy was one of the rights that was never at issue. It was from the beginning of the drafting of the UDHI. It was, um, it was assumed that it would be included. Um, initially, it was worded as a freedom from wrongful interference. Um, and Panama presented one of the first drafts to the UN and articulated the right as freedom from unreasonable interference with his person, home, reputation, privacy, activities, and property is the right of everyone. Um, the same provision in another draft written by the American Labor Federation contained different wording, which is also um, quite revealing about what was on countries' minds at the time. It said, freedom from the terror of secret police surveillance, arrest, or torture. This can be assured only through the abolition of all political police and concentration camps in every country. So at that time, privacy was linked very strongly to um, state surveillance, the activities of security ag agencies, intelligence agencies, etc. So we can see a real resonance, resonance with uh, the situation that we're in today. Um, in 1947, the United States um, uh, threw the draft on the floor and introduced a new wording of the provision, which became no one shall be subjected to arbitrary searches or seizures or to unreasonable interference with his person, home, family relations, reputation, privacy, activities, or personal property. The secrecy of correspondence shall be respected. This is interesting for two reasons. The first is the inclusion of the reference to secrecy of correspondence. It makes it clear that communications, which at that time would have been postal mail or, or telegrams, were considered even then to be an essential element of the private sphere, of a, of a person's private life. And for good reason, of course. It is by corresponding, by communicating, that we develop and reveal our most intimate ideas, thoughts, and beliefs, that we build and maintain relationships, and that we interact with the society in which we live. Even in 1947, it was recognized that to allow states to interfere with letters would not only amount to an interference in the private sphere, but it would have wide-ranging implications on people's ability to express themselves, to keep confidences, to seek the advice of a lawyer, etc. The second interesting element of the, the US clause, the search and seizure clause, is, is the reference to search and seizure, which is basically a copy and paste from the US Fourth Amendment. Um, and so obviously that had a, a very strong influence over the, the US's proposition. The Fourth Amendment is a, um, is a really amazing provision, actually. Um, and it has been the foundation upon which a very strong tradition of privacy jurisprudence has been built in the US. And the Fourth Amendment was actually one of the fundamental um, elements of the formation of the United States. Um, in 1963 in Britain, um, John Wilkies wrote an article in a newspaper called The North Britain, which King George III hit the roof about. And he issued what was called a general warrant, which is more or less the um, olden day version of current day mass surveillance. It allowed the King's agents to go through houses across the country, rifle through papers, open books, etc. They didn't have to have any suspicion, they could just go into whichever house they wanted in order to find anyone who'd been involved in the publication of this article. And there was a number of court cases which followed and, and, and much uproar about the idea of general warrants. And um, over in the colonies in the US, the courts there were equally up in arms and refused to um, issue general warrants. And so opposition to general warrants, to mass surveillance, if you like, became one of the driving forces behind the American Revolution itself. In 1969, one, sorry, the patriot James Otis delivered a speech in Boston denouncing the use of general warrants. And a young John Adams, who was to become the second president of the United States, was there in the crowd and later wrote, every man of a crowded audience appeared to me to go away as I did, ready to take arms against general warrants. Um, Otis's speech was the first scene in the first act of opposition to the arbitrary claims of Great Britain. Then and there, the child of independence was born. So we can see that the opposition to overreach of state power, particularly in the form of surveillance, was in fact one of the driving forces behind the American Revolution. 
Ultimately, the US suggestion was taken out of the Universal Declaration. The provision became, no one shall be subjected to arbitrary interference with his privacy, family, home or correspondence, nor to attacks upon his honour and reputation. And a second sentence was later added at the insistence of all countries of the USSR, which read, everyone has the right to protection of the law against such interference. But let's go back to the United States, because in that country we find all of the modern contradictions and conflicts inherent in the question, are we post-privacy? We know the situation today, thanks to Edward Snowden. But what many of you may not know is the US, as I said, is a country founded um, on a very strong history of privacy jurisprudence, and of course on a strong distrust in excessive government power um, and in direct opposition to government interference in correspondence. Um, in, 1980, sorry, in 1890, a legal academic who later became Chief Justice Louis Brandeis wrote a paper called The Right to Privacy. This is 1890, mind you. Um, and he spoke about the right to privacy as the right to be let alone. And that paper was actually written because it was a time in which um, tabloids were starting to publish gossip about like society parties and things like that. And they found that um, quite an um, objectionable practice. And he wrote about privacy being the right to be let alone. Um, when he became a judge on the Supreme Court, he sat on one of the first wiretapping cases, which was called Olmstead and the United States in 1929. And the court in, in that case decided phone tapping wasn't a violation of the Fourth Amendment, although they subsequently overturned that. Um, but Brandis was up in arms, wrote a scathing dissent of the decision, and he was, wrote a really prescient um, statement, actually. He said... Um, the, the progress of science in furnishing the government with means of espionage is not likely to stop with wiretapping. Ways may someday be developed by which the government, without removing papers from secret drawers, can reproduce them in court, and by which it will be enabled to expose to a jury the most intimate occurrences of the home. Advances in the psychic and related sciences may bring means of exploring unexpressed beliefs, thoughts, and emotions. That places the liberty of every man in the hands of every petty officer, was said by James Otis, of much lesser intrusions than these. To Lord Camden, a far slighter intrusion seemed subversive of all the comforts of society. This is what he said in 1929. So let's skip forward then some 85 years. About 18 months ago, Edward Snowden walked out of his office in Hawaii with the last of the USB sticks that he had used to extract somewhere in the vicinity of of 200,000 documents from the NSA. He spent months collecting that information, of course, having taken the job specifically to place himself in a situation where he would have access to such documents. And he'd been spurred into action a year earlier when he'd watched on C-SPAN um, the Director of National Intelligence, James Clapper, appearing before Congress um, in, answer, in answer to the question, does the NSA collect any type of data at all on millions or hundreds of millions of Americans? Um, he said, no, sir, not wittingly. And Snowden was um, moved into action by this blatant lie. Snowden's story is well known, and I'm not going to spend much time today talking about what he revealed. But um, let us not forget that he showed us that intelligence agencies, of course, possess uh, the ability to intercept um, and are, in fact, intercepting all emails as they pass through um, undersea fiber optic cable landing stations, that intelligence agencies in the UK, the US, Australia, Canada, and New Zealand possess the ability to infiltrate cloud services from Google Drive to Dropbox and get access to documents kept thereon. We know that they can hack directly into users' devices, to computers, laptops, and smartphones, and access information that way. And we also know that they're doing bulk what they call bulk collection of metadata, um, using that data to determine our relationships, our connections, our affiliations, our political devotions, our medical issues, our sexuality, even when we've never made those things explicitly public or known. So Brandis's warning in 1929 was quite prescient. The government, without removing papers from secret drawers, can reproduce them in court. Advances in the psychic and related sciences may bring means of exploring unexpressed beliefs thoughts and emotions. What Snowden has revealed has had absolutely monumental implications for domestic and international law, for the proper functioning of the internet and internet governance, 
for the roles and the responsibilities of the private sector and for communications providers. We could sit here all day talking about the ramifications for tech developers, for legislators, for journalists. But if we kind of zoom out a bit, we can see that one of the things that Snowden has given us is an enormous opportunity. Um, prior to um, the revelations which began last summer, privacy was losing ground, um, if you will. In the first decade of the new Facebook order, as the new capabilities of, of data, big data, um, which are now so ubiquitous and you can't go to a single conference without someone mentioning big data. Someone said to me once, actually, big data is just like teenage sex. Everybody's talking about it, but nobody's doing it, which I think um, seems <laughs> pretty true. Um, but in that, the, you know, late 90s and, and into the noughties, um, it seemed that everybody was got caught up in the excitement of the new potentialities of technology, and for good reason, of course. Um, but there was very little mention of privacy in those debates, save for, of course, um, uh, very persistent um, advocacy groups. But it wasn't a mainstream issue. And blow after blow was landed. So we had Mark Zuckerberg telling us privacy is dead, famously. Uh, Larry Page saying that Google Search, in 2004, said that Google Search will eventually be included in people's brains so that when you think about something and don't really know much about it, you'll automatically get that information. In, in 2011, Eric Schmidt said... Technology is not really about hardware and software anymore. It's about mining and use of enormous volumes of data in order to make the world a better place. Um, what's not to like about that as a proposition? So we all got excited about the prospects of, of these technologies and big data, and privacy was mostly sidelined from the conversation. So in the Western world, we had social networks, smartphone apps, all of them designed mostly by white, middle-class Southern Californians who didn't necessarily have the uh, appreciation for the potential harmful possibilities of the infrastructure that they were creating. The ICT for development movement emerged um, and so these technologies were then touted as a solution for the developing world's woes as well. Um, technologies and systems with huge implications for privacy were pushed and supported by rich Western nations. So you had EU, for example, supporting um, biometric ID cards um, paying for biometric ID cards throughout Africa, um, electronic voting systems, USAID, um, also huge funders of all things technology related. Um, the UK Department for International Development um, was one of the major funders of the Kenyan mobile money system, which is a Vodafone collaboration. Um, so you had uh, Western countries really trying to push um, technologies on to developing countries without necessarily taking um, heed of the potential privacy violations there. Um, and as a side note, we, my organisation does a bit of work in this area and we often receive the response from those people who are very much in favour of that discourse that it's more important that those people eat food than have their privacy protected and that's the kind of idea that, that drives um, that and we call it in a way technological evangelism. So technology became not only a product but a consumer good and a social good, an integral part of public policy both in developed and developing countries. And that is, a, that is an important um, achievement, I think. But all the while, privacy was absent from the conversation. Um, and so Snowden has changed things to a really large degree in that sense. We're seeing not only amongst the development community a recognition that privacy, um, the protection of rights is an essential thing to development generally, but privacy specifically um, in um, big data, open data initiatives is something that they should at least think about. Um, we're also seeing an increasing recognition from um, the private sector of the uh, potential financial incentives for creating privacy-friendly products, which we never had before. I think one of the reasons why Google and Facebook were able to um, uh, roll out such invasive practices was that they didn't necessarily see that there was any consumer demand for better products. So we've seen the, uh, recently the new iOS and Android end-to-end -end encryption functionality being rolled out, Snapchat, other types of um, uh, products in that, in that field. Um, interestingly, the humanitarian sector, which was named in one of the Snowden documents as being specifically under surveillance by the NSA, there's an organisation called Médecins du Monde, Doctors uh, Without Borders, and sorry, Doctors of the World, which is similar to Médecins Sans Frontières, Doctors Without Borders, um, was specifically named as a target of NSA surveillance. And so we've seen quite a lot of humanitarian agencies take 
um, better steps to protect their privacy. Previously, their steps to protect their privacy was to smash their hard drives when they were worried that they were going to get raided by government authorities. Um, and so there are many organisations doing important work to teach them how to use encryption and things like that. And we're seeing ISPs also take a more active stance in pushing back against uh, government surveillance. Um, Privacy International earlier this year coordinated a case with seven ISPs um, in which we sued the British government for um, uh, attacks on um, network infrastructure, which stemmed out of one of the Snowden revelations which showed that GCHQ had attacked uh, the, the Belgian telecommunications authority, uh, telecommunications company, Belgacom. And um, we got, managed to get seven ISPs, including, oh, sorry, ISPs and communications services generally, so including the Chaos Computer Club, to bring a um, legal challenge in the British courts against GCHQ, which will go to trial next year. So onto the corporate sector, what, what of the role of the corporate sector in all of this? There's a strong argument, although not one that I ultimately believe, that because of the speed and the strength with which the huge internet companies grew and portable devices became so ubiquitous um, and the internet became ingrained in our real lives, because that spiralled so quickly and without any time for us to stop and think about the long-term implications for privacy, we ended up with a situation in which um, NSA and GCHQ were able to expand their capabilities capabilities just because of the actions of, of organisations or companies like Google and Facebook. Um, so the argument goes that if we hadn't allowed Google and Facebook to collect all that data, if, they, if people weren't so um, irresponsible with their own data, um, intelligence services wouldn't have had that trove of information to dive into. After all, a large uh, majority of the programs revealed by Snowden were premised on relationships with corporate partners or intercept partners. And you would have seen, of course, the famous PRISM slide, which lists and has the logos of those um, very well-known companies. Um, whether those companies were willing in that process is another question, and there's a, a lot of evidence to show that they did try to challenge those orders. But what is undeniable is that the collection of information is the profit model of Google and Facebook. And if you collect it, index it, analyze it, and link it, you may as well wrap it up in a big red bow and hand it over to the NSA. But I think there's two reasons why this is not only a false argument, but also a destructive one. It's a false argument because it fails to recognize the fundamental purpose of intelligence agencies, which is to create those haystacks. That is what they do, and that is what they've always done. The Five Eyes Alliance, which you certainly would have heard of, was struck in 1946, so 70-odd years ago. But the earliest um, modern-day communication surveillance agencies date back to the interwar period. And, of course, the interception of communications has existed since Roman times, as has encryption. Um, the interception of diplomatic cables has been around since the 30s, satellite inception since the 60s, mass surveillance system like Echelon since the 80s. And large internet services have made those tasks easier, and they may also have independently engineered threats to our privacy, but they are not to blame for the state impulse to conduct surveillance, to make privacy invasions a state policy. Um, to give you an example, I will read this from an un unnamed US government program. The program seeks to develop architectures to integrate existing databases into virtual centralized grand, one virtual centralized grand database containing educational, financial, travel and medical records as well as criminal and other records. Um, the program could also include the development of technologies to create risk profiles for millions of visitors and American citizens in its quest for suspicious patterns of behaviours. It sounds familiar. It's not the NSA. It's uh, the Total Information Awareness Program that was run by the US government from the 60s and was dismantled in 2003 after privacy advocates raised a huge fuss. Um, we know now, of course, that the NSA is doing exactly that and more. So um, it's just to illustrate that I think intelligence agencies are self-sustaining creatures. They believe very strongly in what they do and they will find a way to continue to do that. The second reason why we should not blame technology for the absence of privacy and that we should not say that people who hand their data over to Google and Facebook forfeit any right to complain about NSA surveillance is this. We should not have to choose between privacy and the benefits that are brought to us by the internet and by internet services. We should not have to accept that by making use of the convenience of 
Google Maps, for example, to remember our previous locations, that we therefore have to allow the government to access all of those previous locations as well. That's not the way human rights work. You cannot tell individuals that uh, if they want to claim a right to privacy, they have to, continue, they have to cease using Gmail. It would be the same as saying to women that if they do not want to be victims of rape, then they should stop wearing short skirts. It's not our responsibility to curtail the temptations of our governments to want to track us by tempering our own engagement with digital tools. This year, uh, sorry, this week, on Wednesday, a special rapporteur of the United Nations, um, a very eminent British counsel, QC, Ben Emerson, said, wrote in a report, Anyone who wishes to participate in the exchange of information and ideas in the modern world of global communications is nowadays obliged to use transnational digital communications technology. Internet traffic is frequently routed through different, sorry, through servers located in foreign jurisdictions. The suggestion that users have voluntarily forfeited their right to privacy is plainly unwarranted. It is a general principle of international human rights law that individuals can be regarded as having given up a protected human right only through an express and unequivocal waiver, voluntarily given on an informed basis. In the modern digital world, merely using the internet as a means of private communication cannot conceivably constitute an informed waiver of the right to privacy. I think that's a really important sentiment and one that I hope that we're going to see advanced more, particularly within the United Nations. Some of you may have seen the General Assembly debate um, the week before last, in which you had a number of states referring to the internet as a battleground, um, as a breeding ground for terrorists. Um, I think um, others may have a more accurate quotation than um, I, but um, Senator Glenn Lazarus, who I was surprised to find out as a senator last time I checked, he was a football player, <laughs> I didn't realise that, but um, said last week that um, uh, the internet is the most dangerous place out there or something like that. And I mean, that idea is just so far from where people like us believe the internet is and where, where it should be, of course, as this revolutionary emancipatory tool. The fact that, pe that politicians are getting away with advancing those ideas is really, really frightening. So, I'm, I promise I'm heading into a conclusion. If privacy is not dead, if we are not post-privacy, then we are certainly embroiled in a really complex discussion about what it means in the modern era. Uh, I think there's many elements of that discussion. I'm going to talk about four. The first is jurisdiction. Um, Mr. Emerson alluded to this, um, and that is that we have no control over where our communications go. Um, sitting here, I could email um, Nick, and that one email could pass through any number of jurisdictions. Traditional notions of human rights are based on a state's territorial sovereignty and their obligation to promote and protect human rights within that state. How can we imagine that that right will be useful and effective in a, the digital era um, when uh, communications flow through any numbers of countries, individuals don't know where they're going, we have no ability to choose which country our communication flows through, and um, we have no ability to see whether a state is or is not violating our human rights. Do our human rights travel with our email? I think that's a really challenging question. It's certainly a, a position that Privacy International has been advancing, but I think uh, it's going to be a challenging debate to be had. The United Kingdom, um, in passing that emergency data retention legislation, included a provision which hasn't had as much public attention, which um, extends the scope of the regular Regulation of Investigatory Powers Act extraterritorially. It explicitly states that all the provisions, the warranty provisions of this act apply outside the UK. And the implications of that are that the UK uses RIPA, the name of the act, to compel internet service providers and telcos to provide intercept capability in their networks, um, which has in turn allowed for the mass surveillance programs like Tempora that we've found out are occurring. So what are the implications of the UK saying that they can now ask any ISP anywhere in the world, including here in Australia, to provide intercept capability in their networks for the UK government? The provisions under challenge in the UK at the moment, I think it's going to be a really interesting debate to watch because I'm not sure that there is necessarily a right or wrong answer. I think, is it a good thing that the UK government can exert its power to conduct surveillance outside of its borders? No. But is it a good thing that the UK government has obligations to protect privacy outside of its borders? Yes. How can we advance 
novel approaches to jurisdiction and territory um, without minimising our own rights. A second area of complexity in this, this debate is what does a privacy violation look like? Is it, as Ella said this morning, Target sending you catalogues, marketing pregnancy products to you? Is it having your photo displayed on the front page of the newspaper as being that of a dead terrorist, wrongly, of course? Is it being tracked and arrested and tortured on the basis of your text messages? Or is it simply being caught up in the dragnet? Is it simply having your emails intercepted but not, never finding out about it? One of the very destructive debates we're seeing the Australian government and others um, advance at the international level is that the um, interception of communications by computers is not an interception for the purpose of the right to privacy. It's not a violation of the right to privacy. It's only when you have sentient interception, that is, a human being looks at your email, that it is intercepted for the purpose of human rights and therefore has to be justified. And I think that this is a very dangerous um, argument that they are elaborating um, and we'll, if, if they're allowed to continue to make it will certainly result in the reduction of human rights protections. The European Court has been absolutely um, unmovable in its stance that the mere collection of data, whether it be by a computer or a human being, is always an interference with privacy. It's not to say it's a violation of privacy, but it's an interference which has to be justified. Um, they said even if that data is never used, even if it's never looked at by a human being, in itself it's an interference. They've also said that the mere existence of legislation allowing for that to be done is an interference itself. So threatening and risky is secret surveillance. Even giving governments the power obliges them to show why it is necessary and proportionate. One thing that I'm always asked um, is what is the harm? Where is, where's the harm of a privacy violation? Um, and it's very tempting to, to make the sexy arguments about surveillance being connected to torture, surveillance being connected to the crackdown on journalists, etc. because there is the visceral um, illustration of why surveillance is so destructive. But I think we need to get better at elaborating what the um, non-visible harms are of surveillance. There was a really good article in The Guardian last year about the psychological effects of surveillance, and I think it illustrated very well the societal impacts of, um, of widespread surveillance. It talked about how uh, not only that surveillance free, chills free speech, but that it makes people distrust authority and thus increases insecurity in the country. And it stifles innovation, creativity, and it breeds what the Guardian called a beige society. It breeds conformity. Uh, a third area of complexity is around the relationship between privacy and other rights, particularly the right to freedom of expression. Um, Senator Ludlam talked this morning about privacy and transparency and how they're not mutually exclusive, and I completely agree. Um, I think that how much privacy you have is inversely proportionate to how much power you have. So individuals have a right to privacy, governments have an obligation to be transparent. Um, but inevitably, the question of access to information and privacy will run up against each other. And we've seen that, of course, with... Um, Mr. Wilson's uh, least favourite new right on the block, the right to be forgotten. Um, aside from the fact that he sounded like he'd read 1984 and then swallowed the book and started sprouting um, the lines from it, I think that um, we should not be so alarmist about something like the right to be forgotten. I think that it was a, it was a very conservative decision which said that um, data is worth something to companies and it's worth something to individuals. And if, it's, um, if it is valuable, we should have some say in how it's used and where it appears. Um, and I think that Mr. Wilson admitted in the end that he thinks it's, it's problematic if people's credit card details are online, but didn't seem to think it would be problematic if people's you know, university records from 20 years ago are online and they, they don't want those visible. I can't understand the difference between that, perhaps because he sees the financial implications, potential financial harm of having your credit card violations online, and perhaps he can't see the potential other harms um, to your career, perhaps to your reputation, um, and otherwise of having other details online. But ne nevertheless, there is a big debate out there around the right to be forgotten, um, whether or not it should be called that, and uh, that, is a, that is going to be a challenge to privacy going forward.
Um, and equally, I think questions of freedom um, from violence online pose big challenges to the right to privacy. Lots of the um, discourses around violence against women online, um, sexting, stalking, etc., end up in a place where um, uh, particularly women's activist groups are in some way advocating for the ability of police to have control over communications devices. Um, we've seen in Canada, for example, a piece of law got passed where a judge can confiscate your mobile phone. They can actually order the ISP to cut off your internet service if you've been um, accused of harassing someone on a social media network. And I think that poses really um, significant challenges to how we understand privacy and how we balance out those two societal goods, the need to have privacy online and internet access, and the need for women to be free from violence online as well. Um, and a final issue of complexity in this field is the one of culture. Um, when I first started working for Privacy International, pre-Snowden, um, every meeting I went to, someone said, privacy is a Western concept. It was, it was like everybody's favorite couch cry. Um, and there is an element of truth in that, in the sense that there are um, uh, different countries, different cultures have developed at different speeds in their understanding of what privacy means to them. Um, in Indonesia, for example, we're co told constantly by our partners there that it's a very communal culture um, that's very much um, uh, premised and, and values things like gossip and, and rumour and the importance of sharing stories within a community. Um, which I think is interest that, interesting then when you contrast it against the fact that Indonesia is a, a predominantly Muslim country and in the Quran there's multiple references to privacy related issues, the need for um, secret spaces, gardens to be walled in, etc. Um, and I think that it's not a black or white issue whether privacy is or is not um, more um, uh, familiar to some cultures than to others. For example, in the UK where I live, Obviously, there's CCTV cam cameras everywhere. I don't. I hardly notice them. Um, but people don't talk to each other, and the tubes are really quiet. And then I came home last week, and I was in Country Road or something, and all these people kept asking me questions, saying, "What are you doing today? And where have you been? And what are you up to? And why aren't you working?" And I really felt like I was being interrogated, and, and I felt like really confronted by the fact that people were trying to be very friendly and, and ask about my life, and I just wasn't used to it anymore. And I think that there are kind of it's an interesting elaboration of how people interact within a society. I don't think Australians or British people value privacy any more or any less, but how they kind of apply it in their lives, is, is, it differs, I think. In any event, I think that it's a changing debate. Um, I think that once, we've seen that once most countries have an opportunity to understand why privacy is a valuable um, societal good, how it's used, where the risks are, where the threats are, you will not find someone who doesn't think that it is an important value. Um, and that goes from the countries we work in, from Zimbabwe to the Philippines to Brazil. Um, in the Philippines, for example, there was cybercrime legislation there last, uh, two years ago, and they were able, they had massive public protests. People were out on the streets protesting against cybercrime legislation that was bringing in various internet filtering um, policies. So I think that there's a real potential for these issues to become um, important and part of the local debate anywhere throughout the world. So finally, I think because of that, we should be optimistic about this discourse in Australia. Um, I think there's a real chance that um, we can fight against the data retention proposals um, and make sure that that's not brought in and that we can make Australia a place in which these issues are addressed intelligently and with a really high level of public discourse. I don't think that's a done deal. I, I, I think that it's essential that people like yourselves and the organisations working here today continue to push this as an issue and obviously the politicians. Um, but working in the UK on policy, I have the sense always that we're really up against very deeply steeped historical secrecy and power and often um, there's a sense of helplessness there. Um, we were in court in the summer um, in a case against GCHQ and after the open session of the court, the court went into a closed secret hearing that we weren't allowed to know the date of the time, the location. We have no idea how long it went for, what happened during that hearing. And this is a case that we filed. Um, and so this idea of secret courts and, and so much secrecy, I think, is really deeply ingrained in a country like Britain. Whereas Australia, I think, is 
perhaps I've got a, a rose-coloured glasses on, but it seems more, you know, more open, a younger society, we still have the ability to say that these things are not part of the Australian discourse, um, and we can kind of draw a line in the sand, I think. And, and finally, to, to support that point, Privacy International, where I work, um, was actually started in Australia. Um, the, a, a gentleman by the name of Simon Davies um, in 1985 took up the cause amongst, with others, including the, which later became the Australian Privacy Foundation, um, against the proposed Australia card, which was a national identification card. And um, he managed to mobilise the public in what seems to me now a most incredible way. They had something like 30,000 people protesting on the streets against the introduction of an ID card. Um, they had people like Peter Garrett and Alan Jones and others supporting the campaign. And the ID card was ultimately quashed, never to be seen again. And the Australia card debate now stands as a, um, an, an example to activist groups across the world who are currently fighting the introduction of ID cards in countries, particularly in Africa. Um, and I think that that's a really incredible feat um, and it happened in 1985 um, about an ID card of all things. So I'm confident that it can happen again. Um, perhaps mandatory data retention is the issue that's going to make it happen. Um, so I think that we're far from being post-privacy. I think that there's a real opportunity to make this the major issue in Australia right now. Thank you.